Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline of this is July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, how you doing? Today's Tuesday, April 26th, 2022. Yeah, man. How you doing? How you doing? All right. I'm ready for this. For KJCR, the Game Changer, and NX Networks, Race Hobbs, I am your host, Jimmy Church. And tonight, we welcome very special guest, Scott Walter is here. A full night of Templars and UFOs. Tomorrow night, Dave Schrader is with us. We're going to be talking about the rise of the gods on Marvel. That's right. That's tomorrow night. It's going to be great. Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. What a great week. I, I just, I'm happy. What a great week on the show. Now, coming up, I've got some events that are booked up this year. I will be speaking at the X Conference May 13th and 14th, and I'll be speaking on Friday night. This is an online event. Full info at unxnetwork.com, also in the description box below. And then coming up in June, June 18th, I'll be hosting Disclosure Fest right here in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown L.A., right there next to Chinatown. Again, go to DisclosureFest.org for tickets and info. And then coming up, I will be in Egypt this October with Billy Carson. The Forbidden Knowledge Tour space is very limited. So please go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com for the complete schedule and info, everything that you need is in the description box below right here on YouTube. It's over on our website and, of course, throughout social media, okay? And uh, uh, I've got some other things that I'm going to be announcing as we move along uh, in 2022, and there you go. Okay, follow me on Twitter at Radio. Follow me on Twitter at Radio. And I've got TweetDeck live right here. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on. Uh, I love me some TweetDeck, man. I love me. I love me some Twitter. We'll see what happens with Twitter. Oh, man. But there you go. All right. Who posted this Knights Templar dude playing the drums? Oh, that's Third Stone. That is awesome. <laughs> And uh, I should almost turn on the audio for that. I want to hear what that dude is playing. There you go. He's got sheet music, too. Okay. All right. Follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. If you want to hang out with the fader knots, come on over. Hashtag F2B and get the feed going. I used to announce every night on the show, and I don't know why I stopped doing it. I use TweetDeck, and TweetDeck is a Twitter product. We'll see if Elon keeps it, and he maybe he'll improve TweetDeck. 
I, I, I use the old version of TweetDeck, and TweetDeck runs like a slot machine. So whatever you want to see, um, and for me, I've got myself in column one. I have hashtag F2B in column two, breaking UFO hashtag in column three, and hashtag F2BQ, fade to black questions in column four. I have four columns. You don't have to update. You don't have to click notification. You don't have to do anything. Just as long as you label each column, and it runs like a slot machine, uh, everything updates automatically. And it's great. And you can comment and and just follow along right there. And so for me, for the show, uh, and for you, if you're following the show, because a lot of tweets happen each night, it's hands off for me. I don't have to do anything. And it just clicks right on by. And that's why I just have it live right here. I'm watching it. Blip, 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 blip. Just clicking on by. So get yourself some tweet deck. And once you get tweet deck and you get it installed and and, and stuff, first thing you do, just hashtag F2B and go fade or not. Uh, I need some help. And and we'll walk you through it. It's a, It's pretty simple. But once you tweet deck, I don't use normal Twitter. Um, I guess once in a while on my cell phone, I'll check Twitter out, but normal Twitter, I don't use it. I just use tweet deck. All right. So there you go. Let's get to the breaking news. Another crazy day. Yesterday it was Twitter. Today, Elon wants to make sure that he's still making news. And his boring company called The Boring Company. And, you know, I mentioned yesterday, Elon, you know, now he's got the Internet. He's He controls space, right? He controls the electric car market. Uh, and, and he's also tunneling underneath cities. Yes. And uh, I don't even think he got approval. Uh, to to bore a tunnel from his office <laughs> in downtown L.A. to like the valley. You know, he's just, just digging underground. Well, anyway, the Boring Company said today it will begin testing a full-scale Hyperloop transportation system later this year. So he's got the Internet. He's got space. He's got cars. And electric transportation, he's got all of that cornered, right? He does. He does. And and now it's going to be trains. Yeah. He's going to be a trillionaire soon. According to the white paper released by Elon back in 2013, Hyperloop is a public transportation system that consists of low-pressure tubes with capsules that are transported via magnetic linear accelerators at both low and high speeds throughout the length of the tube. Elon says that the autonomous electric pods will be able to transport passengers at more than 600 miles per hour. I'm trying. 600 miles per hour. Now, they've got the Hyperloop set up in Las Vegas, uh, and he's got deals with cities across the country, and the first real test is getting ready to kick off. That is absolutely incredible. But that's not all the Elon news today. No, I've got more. SpaceX has secured another airline customer for its Starlink internet service. Hawaiian Airlines will use Starlink to provide Wi-Fi on its Trans-Pacific flights, the company announced yesterday. This is the second major Starlink in-flight Wi-Fi announcement in recent days because charter airline company JSX, I've used JSX, by the way, said last week it would offer the service on its Embraer ERJ aircraft, which is generally used by Elon's rich friends. Yeah, JSX is a cool airline, though. Private terminals, private planes. And uh, it's not that expensive. It's it's reasonable, but man, no TSA. You just what you, you know. You feel like you wonder what Spielberg feels like on a private jet. Go check out JSX. All right, 
Well, a major announcement out of the White House today because the White House declared that the United States will no longer conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing to reduce space debris and safeguard satellites, Elon's satellites, in low Earth orbit. Calling on other nations to make similar commitments to work together in establishing this as a norm, the White House added that such efforts benefit all countries. The U.S. is the first nation to make such a declaration and has made it clear that it will engage the international community to uphold and strengthen a rules-based international order in space. Yeah, not a new world order, a new international order in space. Yeah, there you go. Big news, CERN. CERN's Large Hadron Collider, otherwise known as the LHC, came back online last week after a three-year break for maintenance and upgrades. And yesterday, the collaboration announced that two proton beams had been accelerated to a record energy of 6.8 tera electron volts, or TEVs, per beam. Twice the LHC has been shut down for prolonged periods so scientists could make improvements to its efficiency. The last shutdown, this last shutdown, which lasted three years, has just ended, and the machine has returned with literally a big bang. The newly set 6.8 TeV record is nearly the energy the LHC was designed for. Seven TeVs per beam. I don't even know what that means, but I guess it's impressive. All right. Now, let's move on to Mars. The seismometer placed on Mars by NASA's InSight lander has just recorded its two largest seismic events to date. That's right, two earthquakes, two, two earthquakes on Mars, a magnitude 4.2 and a magnitude 4.1 Mars quake. The pair are the first recorded events to occur on the planet's far side from the lander and are five times stronger than the previous largest event recorded, five times. Anna Horlston of the University of Bristol and colleagues were able to identify reflected PP and SS waves from the magnitude 4.2 event called S0976A and locate its origin in the Valle Mineris. Now, S1000A, the magnitude 4.1 event, was recorded 24 days later, but the researchers could not pinpoint the S1000A's location. Mars quakes. They say it's a dead planet. Uh, man, what was the movie, uh, the TV series about Mars? And they uh, they got the two cities going there, started to compete for Mars water. Remember that? One had water, one didn't. Oh, man, that was a good series. It ended for no reason. But anyway, um, it was earthquakes on Mars that led to water. It was the water that was making the earthquakes. I'm just saying it was in a TV series. Must be true. All right. Let's get this show cracking. On this day in history, OTD, 1865, John Wilkes Booth is killed when Union soldiers track him down to Virginia on a farm 12 days after he assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. He was in a barn. He was locked in. And they lit the barn on fire. But that's not how he died. They just kept shooting. Kept shooting into the flaming barn. And then found out they shot and killed him. Yeah. 1865. Fader fact. In 1940. Now listen. I love fader facts. You ready? In 1940, Hallett French, an insurance agent. In 1840. In 1940. Did I say 1840? Did I say 1840? In 1940, 
Hallett French, an insurance agent, sold an $800,000 insurance policy on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and then stole the $8,000 premium he literally deposited in his checking account. I'm not making that up. Hallett thought the new bridge was indestructible. Four months later, it collapsed. He got caught and went to prison for fraud. (laughs) And that is your fader fact. Tonight, we welcome very special guest Scott Walter is here. We're going to be discussing Templars and UFOs. And uh, tomorrow night, Dave Schrader is with us. We're going to be talking about the the rise of the gods on Marvel. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. But what's so great about this week is we have this new video format. So every guest from here on out until we start hitting repeats in, in four or five months. Um, but every guest will be the first time that they've been on Fade to Black with video. And tonight with Scott, because Scott and I, um, we go way back. I mean, if we go, Scott and I go so far back together uh, to the beginning of Fade to Black. I don't know how many shows we've done together. I I, I don't have any. Cl- I, I really don't. Um, but uh, right after I started Fade to Black, I got offered the, the gig over at uh, Coast to Coast AM. And who did I call first? Scott Walter. I said, Scott, you want to be my first guest on Coast to Coast? <laughs> that, that's how far back. Scott and I go, and we've never done video together. And so now this is what's great. I get to go down my best friend's list and say the same thing to everybody, man. Come on, we've got video now. All those great conversations, they've only been me. Now we can do them together. This is awesome. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next three or four months with this new thing that uh, we've got going on here. All right. River Moon Coffee. Fade to Black Blend. Man. You know what I did tonight? This is Fade to Black Blend. But uh, this has got uh, extra creamy, heavy whipped cream. The good stuff. Oh, man. I could stop the show right now. Stop it right now and just drink coffee. And I'm good. Call up Scott. Scott, let's just drink coffee tonight, man. Get get your coffee going. Let's just talk coffee all night. Because that's how inspiring it is. Rivermoonwellness.com. Mmm. CJ, I don't know what this GIF is, but that's pretty cool. It's a puppy in jail. <laughs> oh, look at that face. I mean, it's funny. It's funny. I don't think it's real. It's funny, though. Okay. All right. Ah, Scott Walter's on with us tonight. What is it? What is it about lost history? What is it? I mean, every researcher that is into UFOs and starts with UFOs and they're they're doing their thing ends up in the lost history rabbit hole. Every single one. Everyone. It's crazy. In Scott Walter's case, he was the opposite. Because he left UFOs and aliens alone. And uh, privately, you know, uh, Scott and I talking over the years, off the year. uh, No, man, I know nothing about UFOs and aliens. No, we're not going to talk about that tonight. I said, but no, no, Jimmy, I know. No, 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 not going to do it. I'm not going there. I'm uh, I I deal with rocks, (laughs) right? (laughs) 
<laughs> Talk to me about the Masons. Talk to me about the Templars. Talk to me about rocks. No UFOs and aliens. But look at Scott now. Anyway, anyway, every UFO researcher eventually gets stuck in that rabbit hole. And it's so easy to do. And, uh, and, and, and here's the deal with that. UFOs, see them in the sky. Okay, right? Now, how do you go and investigate that further, right? You see a light in the sky. You see things during the day, night, witnesses, abductions, the books, the documentaries. and you. But where do you go, right? Where do you go with that? With lost history, it's there. You can go and research the past, and it's there. It's up to you to figure out what's real and what isn't. But truly, the past has been covered up for a lot of different reasons. And so you can go and do the easy thing, man. You go to Egypt. Go to Egypt. There's the Great Pyramid. How did that get built? Who, who built that? That right there is lost history because we don't know. That's lost history. It's easy to do. And it's easy to speculate. And as a researcher, when you start getting into things like that, and you go look at Stonehenge. Stonehenge, it's just sitting there. It's there. It's different than UFOs. It's there. You can go, but nobody knows. It just appeared there. Nobody knows anything. That is is lost history. Go back Lee Tepe. Lost history. We know nothing. It's the funnest thing to do. And it's physically, it's there. We can go and look at it. And then we have Scott Walter. When we start to look at uh, what, uh, from the very beginning, things are changing though. Scott has played a big part in this. But when I was a kid, most of you were kids. We're taught about 1492. Christopher Columbus discovers America, right? And that's the story. That's the story. Christopher Columbus. Three ships with Templar crosses on them, by the way. Three ships. And, uh, and discovers discovers everything. And now... Clearly, that is not the case. And because of the efforts of Scott Walter and others talking about that portion of history, which is recent, this is 1492, and uh, there were ships sailing all over the place, all over the world, discoveries being made all the time. And was Christopher Columbus the first? Or did something else go down? And the reason why this part of history for me, and I'm sure that Scott and I, one way or another tonight, will discuss this, is that when we look at the Kensington Ruin Stone and, and its significance and where it was found and how it was found and, and who put it there reveals a land grab. Now, here we have the United States, arguably the coolest place on earth. All right, uh, to live, right? It's really cool here. You know, you know, people can debate it and, and stuff, but it's really cool. This is the United States. But what if hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus, that somebody else was here and claimed the land, right? That this could be... The United States of Scandinavia. <laughs> right. And that is a reason for a cover-up. So no matter what, and, and, and it's not just the Kensington Ruinstone. Many civilizations could have been here before Christopher Columbus. And uh, it, if, if, if that is indeed the case, you would want to cover that up. You don't want to have another country laying claim to the United States in a legitimate sense. 
And if the Kensington Rune Stone was legitimately verified by the United States and universities as being what it's, it is said to be through Scott's research and others, then we don't have the United States. And all of the history that has been established here, and I'm talking about Great Britain and France, the Louisiana Purchase, <laughs> all of that. What if that was, uh, that's all owed to Scandinavia, <laughs> Finland, Norway. Think about that. And that is lost history. And that is what makes things so much fun. And it's an easy thing to do because once you're a UFO researcher and you're into this subject or Bigfoot, a ghost, the paranormal, you know, time travel, all that stuff, you have an open mind and you are looking for answers and you have questions and you're moving forward, right? And that's it. And when lost history is right there. The same reasons we are looking into this are the same reasons you look into our past and wonder why things have been covered up. And I said it last night on this show to Whitley Strieber, told you about that autograph in my Balboa High School sophomore year yearbook. Steve, next door neighbor, he's in the Army. Uh, he's married to a woman named Tree, Stephen Tree, T-R-E-E, -E, her name was Tree. Uh, he signs my yearbook, The World is Not What It Seems. That's his autograph. And that's how I have lived my life ever since. <laughs> ever since. All the other autographs in that year, but Jimmy, you rock. Yeah, guitars forever. Uh, smoke weed. Whatever it is, you know, that you write in a sophomore year book. You know, pages and pages and pages. There's Steve's. The world is not what it seems. And that's why I enjoy lost history. This is Fade to Black tonight on Lost History Night. Scott Walter is with us. And it is going to be one of those conversations. And it's the first time that Scott and I, the both of us, have been here on video. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Dave Schrader is with us. And then Thursday night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. I'll be right back after the short break with our guest, Scott Walter. Stay right there. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. <laughs> You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com this is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. 
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, Unx Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walters here. We're going to be discussing Templars and UFOs. It's the first time we have been together on video for you, Fade or Not. It's going to be a great night. Scott is an author, host of America Unearthed, and has been president of the American Petrographic Services since 1990. Scott is responsible for the Independent Petrographic Analysis Testing Laboratory, where the Kensington Rune Stone was brought for investigation in the year 2000. He has been the principal petrographer in more than 7,500 investigations throughout the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico, including the evaluation of fire damage concrete at the Pentagon following the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Both of his websites, thehookedx.com and scottwalteranswers.blogspot.com are over on our website and you can go and check those out. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Scott Walter. Scott, there he is. How you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Jimmy. And I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited. But before we get going, I have a question for you. Yeah. Is, is this the first week that you have done um, these uh, video interviews? Well, yeah, we uh, uh, technically, yes, we we ramped up last week, ironed out some issues. Uh, this week is the first first week where I think uh, our feet are on the ground. Okay, so but I'm going somewhere with this. So okay. last night was the first time you did an interview ever like this, right? Sort of. Yeah. Okay. I, sure, Scott. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> You're blowing my thunder here, man. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah. want everybody to know, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I really, I'm saying this as a compliment to you and really, uh, so people can appreciate, um, our friendship. Um, I was supposed to be on last night, right? Yes. And, and we switched because somebody had a conflict, which is no problem, but I just want to say, I was supposed to be the first guy to do an interview like this. And that's the way it was supposed to go down. It doesn't matter. It's just that I want to tell you how, um, how much I appreciate that. And I do think it says something about, I mean, everything we've been through and the support you've given me. And I, I got to just tell you, Jimmy, I appreciate it. And um, it's, it's awesome. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. And, and I appreciate that, Scott. And, and I, I think that uh, the audience by now has picked up on uh, our special bond uh, that is between us, but, um, and I mentioned uh, coast to coast and, and I kind of told a fib, I'm going to tell everybody actually what happened. I'm pushing a shopping cart <laughs> through fries and, and Scott knows the story. And I call up Scott from fries. I'm pushing a shopping cart. And uh, I just got the gig at, at Coast, and I said, uh, Scott, would you like to be my guest on, on Coast to Coast? You know, I just started over there. And Scott goes, 
man, I'm kind of busy. I did not say that. Like Scott, come on, I could really Jimmy, not uh, Janet, and I got plans. Oh, and, no. and I think I'm playing football that day, and <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm booked up. Um, but and, and see, and this is the deal um, uh, for everybody. Um, when I call up Scott, or he calls me, whatever. But when I call up Scott and say, Scott, let, let's do something, uh, the answer is always immediately a yes. But the great thing is, what do we talk about? Because there are so many things, right? So many areas uh, that we can go into. And that's the funnest part uh, when I have you on the show, Scott, is is getting other stuff out of the way. There's so much that we can talk about, right? And, 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 and so I mentioned early on uh, uh, in my intro in the show I'm going to I'm going to take a wild guess here. We are in 2022 by the way. So you and I have been doing interviews now for 9 years. That's that's crazy to think about. But um <laughs> I'm going to say that 8 of those 9 years were non-UFO and non-alien or uh, 7 7 of those 9 years. Where oh. you were, you were like, "No, man. I'm not going there. I'm not I, going I, I, I couldn't do anything. I, I, I didn't know anything. And, and, and my, how the world has changed. Right. Do you remember the, uh, the phone call this two, two years ago, you called me up and uh, you go, Jimmy, are you sitting down? And I said, Oh, oh crap. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, I am officially sitting down. Okay, man, I got to ask you some UFO questions. <laughs> I said, what? Do you remember that phone call? Yes, yes. And I was like, what is going on, Scott? And he said, man, uh, uh, we'll save that for another show. Yeah, but yeah. you go A, B, C, D. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And Janet is <laughs> sitting next to you in the car going, Jimmy, yes, yes. I was I'm like, not oh, kidding. I'm not yeah. kidding. Yeah. yeah. I'll never and You know what, Jim? And it is. I, I don't even, there's a couple of stories that I would like to tell you tonight about how strange and how weird this whole experience has been. And, <clears throat> um, you know, stop me if I've told the story before when we get to that point. But man, ever since this UFO uh, subject matter has come into my life, it's just been like a hard left turn. Um, but you know what? As strange as it's been, it's really been, it's been eye-opening. I have, uh, it's forced me to kind of rethink some of the things I thought I knew about the world and about life. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to sort of take, take a step backwards. And I mean, I was, I've been plowing ahead so hard with everything I've been doing all, all these years. It's actually been kind of nice to take a little bit of a, of a left turn and try something different. And boy, oh boy, has this been different, <laughs> but well, it, it's good. Hey. And, and and another thing that I just mentioned, and I think it's a point worth uh, bringing out, is that most UFO researchers or paranormal researchers right. end up eventually in, into lost history. And the paths always, you know, take you down these certain roads, whether it's Egypt or Stonehenge or, or the Mayan cultures and Central and South America and things, you, 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 you go down these rabbit holes in, in lost history. And that's our path. We start with UFOs. We end up with rocks. You, <laughs> you started with rocks and I took the opposite path and, and uh, ended up in, in the UFO world. Very yeah. strange way, but, but this is, I think this is the excellent point, is you've got that foundation. You've got that foundation of lost history and, and out there chasing the story and, and what rocks and geology means and, 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 and languages and, and alphabets and inscriptions. You have that foundation. And then when this UFO thing starts to come out, aliens, contact, uh, whatever, you've got that foundation behind you. Most researchers don't have that. So you did the opposite approach, but I think in the end you won. Well, I don't know if I won, but um, I, I think having that base was good, right? And, you know, I, <laughs> I joke about having a strong foundation when you're building a case you have to have evidence, but it starts with a strong base. And what could be better than a 
the best strong base than the earth itself, right? And so um, that's where, you know, my world starts and it comes up from there. But yeah, it has been a really strange ride. But, you know, when, when you were, I was just listening to you just now, just describe that, Jim. And to some people, uh, the paranormal UFO world seems like a completely different uh, worlds away, if you will, subject matter when you're talking about uh, rune stones and, and uh, controversial history and, uh, you know, Egypt and all that. But really, uh, the more I dig into this, the more I find that they dovetail together way more than you can possibly imagine. And, um, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. I've actually been uh, looking at alien artifacts for over 10 years. Uh, we had a conference here in Minnesota about 10 years ago, the Paradigm Symposium. And I walked into that thing and there was this guy sitting there uh, who ended up being a guest on the show, uh, Mark Russell. And mm -hmm. he had a whole table of these artifacts. And I came walking in. And remember, I don't know anything about this subject matter. And I see this stuff on the table like this. Right. right? Now, if you take a closer look at this artifact, Jim, do you see the symbols on there? I do. Okay. Now, look closely and you will see not one of them repeats. Right. This right. is this is not an alphabet. It's not a language. Um, I don't know what the hell it is, frankly, but I became, this is really what got me intrigued to begin with were these symbols. And I've got several of these artifacts. And starting 10 years ago, I talked with a good friend of mine and a brilliant researcher, Alan Butler, who wrote many um, what I, I consider to be the finest books on the Knights Templar, but he's also very open to the paranormal and certainly the UFO subject matter. And he took an interest in this too. But what got Alan going wasn't so much the symbols, which he was interested in, although that's what I resonated with. He was interested in the, the depiction of spacecraft, of, of heavenly bodies, of objects in the heavens, and the size and the ratios of these different heavenly bodies. Now, right. a lot of people don't realize it, but there's incredible mathematical ratios that are associated with the sun, the moon, uh, the earth, and all the other planets to the point where if you understood it all, you would just go, wait a minute, that can't be possible. Uh, but it's true. And those same ratios that Alan has written about is depicted on these artifacts. And that to him being mathematically correct is something that just blew his mind away. Now, these symbols, um, I, got, I went down the rabbit hole so far with these things, Jim, is I started to write them out. I would draw them. Uh, and I have a book, I can show it to you, where I wrote down over a thousand symbols on a bunch of these artifacts. Not one repeats. Hmm. Not one. <laughs> been able to figure anything out um yes um <clears throat> the, the, and i don't know how you, you would vet what i'm about to tell you because obviously when somebody tells me something or i come across something the first thing i want to do is try to vet it out to see if it has credibility right sure and i have talked to some people who um one of them i haven't even met yet because he lives in southern mexico in a region that's um you know not a safe place to visit. But this guy has told me that these symbols on these artifacts actually represent telepathic communication. And so if that's true, um, which I'm inclined to believe that it is after some of the information that's been shared with me with you know who, uh, and actually some other people, I got a funny story to tell you uh, about um, undercover people that um, have revealed themselves to me as I go along this journey. But if indeed this is a representation of telepathic communication, that would explain why these artifacts do not have the same symbols on, um, you know, they, they don't repeat because the they message don't. is a different message, you know, yes. all the way through. Yeah, there has been a lot of inside of our community, a lot of research into light language and uh, and and light writing, you know, uh, and and uh, it is a flow of consciousness. Right. right? 
And yeah. so people, and, and which is exactly what you're talking about. So uh, do you remember uh, the movie Arrival? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you remember they were trying to figure out the language, the communication, right? And that was a flow of thought, right? Right. It wasn't uh, necessarily. Now, eventually, they they cracked the code, but they cracked the code to find out that it was uh, it was a it was a non repeating flow of thought thing, and and telepathy. If if you're communicating with somebody, now I don't have telepathy and I've never experienced it, but I understand the concept, Scott, which is there there isn't a common language there. That's not what it is. It's no. it's it's an exchange of thought. So you're seeing it may even be almost like colors or frequencies, you know, and and a vibration that you're receiving. And it's not going to repeat, and you don't have to understand the language. It's it's a vibrational thing, and it's a flow of energy, and that would right. explain exactly what you're talking about there. That well, it and, is it is just a flow of thought. Well, and that's exactly what the guy was was explaining to me. The, a couple of people I've talked to were were trying to explain, and he told me he said, "I can read these things. I can tell you." what they say, what it was that they were thinking. And I haven't had a chance to follow up on that. That was just last week we had that conversation via text. And it's been a little bit challenging because he doesn't speak very good English and I don't speak very good Spanish. So mm -hmm. it's been a little bit challenging. But, <clears throat> you know, Jimmy, I, I, I wanted to just tell you a quick story. And I'm not sure if I've told you. Stop me if I've already told this story. But <clears throat> this guy that I told you about that I met, well, actually, he contacted me. It's almost exactly two years ago now. And uh, he went by the name Holden back then, but his, he's changed his identity because there have been some issues um, since I've been doing these interviews with people trying to out him. And um, it's been unfortunate for him uh, and it's created problems for him. But um, I'm, I'm trying my best to just tell people, look, just chill and um you know, if somebody wants their privacy respected, you know, you, you need to honor that. And I know how curious people can get. Um, I would like to know who this guy, what his real name is and all that. But you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm okay not knowing. But so, so this happened about a, about a year ago. <clears throat> um, we had been talking and um, I don't know, a day or two later, a fan sent me uh, a it was on Twitter, sent me a message on Twitter and said, hey, Scott, did you guys ever figure out what that UFO was in that Montezuma episode? Mm -hmm. and, I text and I texted it back. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, that UFO that was, you know, in that shot during your show. I said, what are you talking about? So he sent me a screen grab. And it was, that's, it was, the one, that's the one where you guys are next to the water. Yes, yes. It was a wide shot. It was a wide yeah. shot. And right. there was just a sliver of the sky in the upper left-hand side. And I actually went into the production company, Committee Films, and I asked Andy, I said, hey, man, check this out. Can we take a look at the raw video? And one of the editors walked in, Ryan Soul, and he said, I got time right now. Let's go do it. And so we went in there, and he pulled it up. And there was this thing that was bobbing up and down and rotating like this. Mm -hmm. And he zoomed in about four times. He had it just, you know, the way they shot it twice, four times, eight times. And this was not a, a balloon. This wasn't a plane. It was something else. And I showed it to Holden. He said, hey, this, this looks legit. I'm going to have to fill out a report on this. He said, do you know the guy that owns the land? And I said, yeah. I said, I interviewed him during the episode. I said, that was about eight years ago. I can't remember his name. Um, he said, well, can you get a hold of it? I said, well, I'll contact Andy and Maria and I'll get it from them. So this was a Friday night. I remember this because we were talking to him until two in the morning. And finally, I just had to tap out and say, hold on, I'm going to bed, man. But I will uh, try to find out who that guy is. And so I went to bed, you know, two o'clock to two fifteen. I swear to God, I woke, woke up at six thirty. I checked my email. There was an email from this guy. 
I had not heard from him. I had not talked to him. And there was an email from him. It was, it was a group email. It was some political thing, but he copied me on it. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Seriously? When, <laughs> when, what is that? What is he, that, Jim? Uh, here's the deal. You when you called me that morning. Do you remember and, this? Yeah, yeah. You called me that morning, and I told you then. I said, Scott, synchronicities, man. And you and I had that whole conversation about synchronicities, and 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 you were out of your mind. I'm still out of my mind. <laughs> and I remember going. Dude, no big deal, man. This this happens all the time, man. Oh this yeah, is- oh yeah. Well, maybe in your world, pal, but not in mine. Okay. Remember, I'm the scientist. I'm the lab guy. This shit doesn't happen to me. Right, 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 right. And uh, uh, I don't have uh, the video in front of me uh, that you sent me. Uh, I remember the production company sent yeah. you the clip. You sent me the clip. I got I it somewhere. I don't have it handy. I didn't know I'd need it. Right, right. Um, but it's a pretty interesting shot. And and here's okay, so back to this point. Um the the location is in the middle of nowhere. Yes. So there wasn't any events, there's no airports, there's no balloon Santa Fe balloon races going on. <laughs> no. and, and it it's got a weird little thing that it does do. Um, it looks like it 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 semi rotates a couple of times. Right, it's sort of it's kind of back and forth, kind of rotating like this, you know. Yeah, it acted yeah. balloonish. I, I said that to you. I said, "Is this a balloon?" And um, yeah. but uh, it, I looked at it so many times. I don't think it's a balloon. I just no. don't know what it is. No. I, yeah, it's a very. Oh, inter- I, but, but but I guess my point wasn't so much either the occurrence of this thing, although I th- I thought it was so weird. Um, I remember shooting that that episode. I remember that day distinctly because what happened that day was almost as weird as what happened, you know, eight years later with this UFO thing. But the whole point was that pond that we were on. There, that pond had been created by damming up the small stream that flowed through that little canyon there. And it created this pond, which uh, intentionally or not intentionally drowned a a, a cave a that cave many out. people thought was uh, led to Montezuma's treasure. And so I I ended up diving into that. And the scene we shot where the UFO appeared was when we put an underwater drone to go, you know, and scout it out before I went in there. But when I went in there, Jim, it was um, it was so bizarre because what happened was we had two safety divers. And then we had a cameraman, Ryan, and the, the the two the two safety divers were brothers that were local guys that they hired to be in the water while I was down there. Well, while we were filming all the B-roll stuff underwater, uh, Ryan, who's very thin and it was cold, it was like spring water, got hypothermia. And I remember right before we were going to do the dive in the cave, he comes up to the little paddle boat that they had. They were filming from... Uh, you know, on top of the water and Ryan's sitting there and he's, uh, blah, 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 you know, he's just shivering. I said, Ryan, get the hell out of here, man. You're going to, you've got hypothermia. You can't come down. So we lost him. And the brother, uh, one of the brothers had left the water and took all of his, his stuff off. And he was sitting in the car and we were running out of daylight. We couldn't wait for him to come. So we were down to one guy. And he had to run the camera. So we had no safety divers. It was just he and I. So we go down into this cave. And it's not that deep. It's about 40 feet down. But it was a negative incline. So I'm diving along this cliff that's going down, you know, at a negative slope. And then the cave was down at the bottom. And I get down there. And it's only about four feet high. I'm six feet tall. And so I couldn't really swim because it was tight. So I got on my knees and I'm kind of crawling. Well, there's dirt there. So it's kicking up dirt and it was kind of a cluster. And so we're going in and this, this one of the brothers, he took the camera and I could see the lights behind me and he's following me in. And I went in probably, I don't know, 20 feet or so, which doesn't seem very far, but underwater in a cave, it seems like a mile, right? And I kept looking up right above my head, like right here was the roof of this tunnel and I was watching my bubbles and they were flowing back out to the entrance. So I knew how to get out. Right. 
So I get in there at about 20 feet and I stop and I looked up and my bubbles were just sitting there. They weren't going out anymore. And I looked into the cave and it was dark and it was actually looking like it was opening up to something. Right. And just for a second, I'm like, no gunner, you're not going. <laughs> and I turned around and I just, I said out. So he backed out and we got out, but, um, that's what, I, treasure, I would, that's what treasure does to you. That's how people get never. killed. Yeah. Yeah. I would never, I, I, I watched the, uh, the episode, I don't know how you do it um, <laughs> now. Uh, and and uh, uh, we're heading towards a break. We got about two minutes okay. uh, or a little bit less. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, talking about lost history, you know, we're all taught, you know, 1492, right? Yep. Uh, that's it. We're, we're raised on that. Yep. And the tide is definitely starting to shift. And I think that uh, because of your efforts and, and others, right. Well, for uh, sure. Yeah, that that keep driving this home. That uh, Columbus wasn't the first. Uh, history is starting to get rewritten. Now we have done many shows on the Cremona document and and other mad adventures of of Scott Walter. When we come back after the break, uh, I want to go pretty deeply into what the Cremona document is. Okay. It's history. And because that's going to be a big chunk of the show moving forward. And it's very important that everybody understands there it is. And this is the other thing about video tonight, Scott. You get to just yeah. reveal. And, 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 okay, I've got 30 seconds. Get mm. up and grab that sword. I want to see that sword. <clears throat> Which the one? one? The one that's hanging. That one right there. Okay, bring it up to the camera. <laughs> what is that? <clears throat> this is a sword that is used in Masonic ritual. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I'm a, actually a member of three different Templar orders, some Masonic, some not. And a sword is um, a very important article that is used in ritual. Of course, most people believe uh, well, most people know that it was used uh, by the Templars and, and many, many other groups, uh, Saracens, um, can as, you a hold weapon, as a weapon, but it is also a very important symbol. Can you hold the hilt up to the camera? It's so ornate. Yeah. Let's see, how's that? Wow. Look at that. All right. Oh, man. Yeah. All right, let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, the one and only Scott Walter. I am your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. This, <laughs> this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is here. It's Templars and UFOs all night long. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community, and with my personal invitation, you can, right now, get your free 30-day membership at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull 
or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hi, Race Hobbs with the X. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you have an interest in unexplained phenomena like ghosts, Bigfoot, and UFOs. And by now, you know that we have our own X blog, the UnX newsletter, and the UnX magazine quarterly. But most of you don't know that we have started our very own paranormal conference. And this year, for safety, this two day X Con will be virtual. So you can attend from the comfort of your home. X Con presenters include Whitley Strieber, Micah Hank, Margie Kay and Preston Dennett, Lisa Martin and Wayne Lawrence, Lee Spiegel, Debbie Zegelmeyer, Dan Terry, Kate Grabowski, and Ray Hernandez. There will also be a live paranormal investigation by the Riverside, Iowa Paranormal Team. So come hang out with us in the safety of home as we set out to explain the unexplained Friday, May 13th and Saturday the 14th, 2022. And tickets are on sale now. Go to unexnetwork.com. That's Unexnetwork.com. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. And tonight, it's Templars and UFOs. And, and that that's a broad... <laughs> what that allows is uh, Scott and I to, to to talk about whatever we want to talk about. And uh, we just go to Templars and UFOs. We can go in any direction that we want. But, uh, Scott, right before the break... Uh, the Cremona document, and this goes back uh, for you and I. Uh, we did uh, uh, an exclusive show on 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 coast to coast about this when uh, the uh, some some new uh, we had breaking news on the Cremona document. We've done a few shows here on Fade to Black about it. Um, tonight is the first time we can do this together, and so let's go with a brief history of what the Cremona document is. What is it? The Cremona document is a compilation of documents, maps, letters, um, and various papers that actually span several centuries. And what we, what we now know is that in 1858, 
there was uh, a cartographer who was tasked with taking all this material that had been assembled over the centuries for the Knights Templar Order, and he was to compile it into um, one full set. Now, when I say set, one part is the narratives. There are letters. Uh, we've got some of these letters that um, some of them are original letters that are old, sealed with wax. Um, got another letter here that's got a map on the back. I can't show it too much. I know people can do screen grabs and I don't want that. But um, the, the bulk of the narrative is written in uh, Theban text, the map on the back. But the whole story really came full circle about a year ago when um, a puzzle box was delivered to the guy that we're working on this story with. His name is Donald Rue. He lives in New York. And Don has worked for a, let's see, private security company is what he wants me to say, working for our government, working for our military, um, <clears throat> starting in 1961. And his best friend, Bill Jackson, started in 1962 after he served in the Korean War. And they, um, they were involved in this thing from 1968 all the way up to the present day. Uh, I'm going to be leaving on a trip to go to New York tomorrow. And we're going to be meeting with Don because he may have some more material. Um, it's funny. Today I got an email from him because he and I are writing a book together about this whole story. And what I've told him is I said, look, Don, you are the last man standing. All your colleagues with the agency, the private security company, have passed on. Um, the guy that started the company, Dan Spartan, died last year. And he was the one that sent this box. And it was the holy grail of boxes that Don has received. Now, let me just back up a, a little bit and tell you that in 1968, these guys were um, swimming in the Hudson River off Bannerman Island. And they were looking for munitions in the water that had been blown into the water when the island or the munitions cache that Francis Batterman was, a, was an arms dealer from the Civil War and then his son dealt uh, arms into World War I. But there was an explosion on the island. It blew all the stuff into the water. And these guys were salvaging it, going into the Bronx, selling it to make money. Well, while they were doing that, Don found a couple of decorative bulbs that had been blown onto the eastern shore uh, of the river. And he gave them to his friend, Bill, whose wife was a gardener, thinking maybe she could use these things. A year later, he discovered that one of the boxes was hollow, and inside he found a brass device with Theban script all over it. And this led him on a hunt to try to figure out what the hell did he find. There was also a clay tube sealed with beeswax with two parchments in it that have since been decoded. They were also written in Theban, which is the coded alphabet uh, used by the Templars. <clears throat> He ended up buying uh, the Cremona document in Italy in 1971. And the first thing he did with Don was say, hey, Don, um, I want to go up to Newfoundland to go scuba diving. Now, <clears throat> Don never married, never had a family. He doesn't have any family left to this day. And he was always available. Besides, this was his best friend. And the best part is Bill was going to pay. So they went up there. And what they were looking for was one of six ships that had hit rocks, had been offloaded, and then towed back out and scuttled. These six ships date back to the 12th century, late 12th century, when there was a mission by the Templars led by a Templar knight named Sir Ralph de Sudley, whose mission was to come over to North America to find scrolls that had been hidden here sometime before the 10th century. We don't know when they were hidden uh, in the Catskill Mountains, <clears throat> uh, what are now called the Catskill Mountains. So once they, they found that ship, they found that damn ship. Now, in this book, one of the things that I had been pressing Don to do, and he has done a fantastic job, is I said, I said, Don, look, <laughs> 
you need to write about these experiences that you had, okay? I want you to cut a vein. I want you to tell me what you think, what your feelings were. Tell us about that whole experience. I mean, this guy found, he and his friend, a 12th century Templar ship. So anyway, when I asked him to write this narrative about a month ago, it's almost a month ago, um, you know, he said, you know, Scott, I think I wrote some notes about that trip. And I said, well, you better find them. <laughs> right. The next day he called me, said, I found the notes. I made copies of them and they're in the mail to you. He doesn't email anything. He's an old school guy. It's always got to go through the mail. He doesn't trust email. He's an old spy. Okay. So anyway, when this thing showed up, 22 pages of detailed notes, sketches. He's got the mast, the brass bar, the rock with the symbols carved on it. He's got drawings of the parts of the keel that they brought up. They found this damn ship. And then they gave it, according to them, uh, to the Canadian officials up there, which I highly doubt they either didn't know what they had, but if they do, if they did know what they have, they're not going to tell us about it. But in any case, a lot of that ship is still there. We're going up this summer to find that sucker. Well, this. Oh, no. Well, OK. So okay, that's that's an, that's OK. Well, I'll stop right here. Go ahead. Well, just to encapsulate what you have just suggested. 1492 is Columbus, right? That that date is there. Now we are talking about 12th century and 10th century. So we are, we're pushing back uh, two, three, four, five hundred years before Columbus. This is uh, the year this ship went down was 1178. Right. So do the math. That's what, yeah. three, four hundred years? More 400. than 400 years. Yeah, it's 400 years. Over 400 years. 400. So, yeah. well, well, let's put it this way. Um, <laughs> I don't this this notebook is dated 1961. He even in his write up he told me that his dad this was given to him as a gift because he used to do sales uh with with uh, with, with Japanese dealers that would come over and they gave him this notebook. I mean the detail is incredible. But let me just continue. So this convinced his buddy Bill Jackson that the story was true. Keep in mind the whole time Don didn't know what the hell was going on because Bill never told him. Right. So so then they spent the next six years hiking the Catskills. And Don, in his narrative that he wrote about this part of the story, was happy to do it because he was planning to do a, a summer long hike along the Appalachian Trail, which he eventually did. And this was going to get him in shape for doing that. And on October 11th of 1977, they found the tomb of Altamara. She was the navigator of De Sutley's ship who was killed while she was over here and buried inside of a small cave. Her body was burned. It was put inside of an urn and, along with other artifacts in this cave. And they found that too. And there are now, pictures, pictures and everything of all of this. Now, uh, let's stay with her for a second. Yeah. Um, when they discovered the cave, um, it, uh, I want to talk about her urn and what was inside of the cave and, and how it was, I'm going to use the word stacked, right? Can I say stacked? Is that the right <laughs> word? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, why not? Yeah, how was the, uh, outside of the cave? What, did, how did they find it? And, and was it hidden? Yes, yes, it was. Well, the way that they found it, and I don't have the materials here, but there were very careful drawings uh, with directions and, and measurements they took in the sky. There's also carvings on the mountain that are still there that they use as directional indicators. There's also a rock called Table Rock, and that is, and it's still there. I go there, I've been there many times. And it's a big, tall, pedestal-shaped rock that's flat on the top. And they use that for sighting. And so they basically said at 30 degrees between these two symbols, you go this many feet, that's where the cave is, and it's there. And so they remove what is in front of the cave, and they go inside. You've read this story. You just gave yourself away because I didn't tell you about something in front of the cave. You know this story, don't you? <laughs> I think we talked about it off of the air. I, I, I have a really good memory. But, um, but here's the deal. Um, 
they this this was undisturbed is my point. When, well, when actually, no. <clears throat> it oh. looks like there were other people that had been there in the historical past prior to those guys in 77. And actually, we know that because one of the letters I showed you, this one, which actually is published in my book, so I can show this, written by Lionel DeWaldern. Yep. And uh, it's dated 1656. Now, this letter talks about recovering the rest of the scrolls because in 1178-79, the subtly returned to Europe in 1180. <clears throat> he did not recover all of the scrolls. The uh, priestess of the temple of the goddess, as it's called in the narrative, um, he had to go through a three-day ritual to earn the right to collect the scrolls that he came over here to get. And she only let him take some of the scrolls. Oh, but, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. No, yes. what I was suggesting is in a modern sense, they were the first people. Uh, oh, right, right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not talking about deep history. No, we're not no, going no, there. No, no, no. Okay, okay. So, so back to my point. Right. Uh, they must have lost their minds because they went in and uh, stuff was there that has been untouched for centuries. And uh, can you describe uh, how it was displayed, I should say? Well, the cave is <clears throat> the cave is really small. I mean, I've been up there. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but in our downstairs fireplace. Yes. It's not a hell of a lot bigger than that. I mean, it's a little taller than that. <clears throat> it's maybe four and a half feet tall, but it's only about four feet wide. But it goes back about eight feet. And the um, the urn, you know, was, you know, was about this big. There was a, a, a big flat rock that sort of, you know, was the floor of the cave and it had carvings on it. And uh, there were there was a navigation device in there. There were some other uh, uh, stones, uh, rough, precious stones and inside some metal brass framing. Seriously, I'm not making this up, was a rough 10 carat diamond. That diamond has its own history that we haven't even talked about. There were eight people that owned that diamond from 1977 to 1983 or 1984. None of them owned that stone for longer than one year. Within one year of owning it, all eight of them were dead. Hmm. All eight. Who's got the, who's got the diamond today? I don't know, and I don't want to go near that damn thing. <laughs> I don't want to know either. Um, uh, so, but they they see this um, uh, uh, undisturbed, you know, for for centuries. And what goes through Rue's mind? I mean, I can't imagine. We all love a good treasure hunt, yeah. But it's the thing when something actually happens, right? Well, you know, I I think. You know, it's one of those things, Jim, think about this. I mean, <clears throat> we've all been through some amazing experiences in our life, right? And, and and you know, like imagine if you were there when, when JFK got shot or some major historical event, you were right in the middle of it. And, right. you know, it's years later down the road, you're talking about it. Well, yeah, that was a sad day. And then other people are like, holy shit. I mean, you were there. You saw this. You, ex oh my God, that's. I mean, how come you're not more, you know, like lit up about this? Well, I was there, you know, and I think you get what I'm saying. This is kind of the way Don is. He's sort of aw shucks about it. But I will say I have seen him get excited a couple of times when things have happened. But he's, I mean, if you knew some of the stuff that he has done, and I have to tell you, well, I, I, well I've got a second, Jim. He has shared with me some of their, um, uh, company reports. And this guy is an American hero. Some of the stuff that he has done for um, not just our country, but really for the world to get rid of some really bad people. And he will never talk about it. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's been shot. Um, what he's done, he, he can't talk about it. And I can't really talk about it other than to say, I've read those reports he is an absolute hero and somebody who will never be publicly recognized. 
Um, but I'm going to say a lot after he's, you know, after he passes, if, if I outlive him, because this guy deserves it. And so there's a humbleness about him. And there's also um, a stoicness about him where he's just, you know, nothing phases him. But, but this thing has been gnawing at him because after they found that, right, there really wasn't anything else to go find. So Bill decided that he wanted to write a book about this story. He interacted with some academics. They were complete assholes, just like the experience that I've had. Let me preface this by saying not all academics are assholes, but a lot of them that I've dealt with, calling them assholes is being nice, okay? okay. Yes. And, so, and so Bill had that experience. He got frustrated. He said, screw it. I'm going to write a novel. So he started working on the novel. Now, this was getting into the late 1980s early 1990s, and he realized that he had arterial sclerosis. He was a medical doctor, by the way, and he also had um, early Parkinson's, and he knew he wasn't going to live long. So he decided he scrapped that whole thing, <clears throat> and he um, decided that he was going to sell the document. Now, when we get done talking about it, and I have something that I want to read to you that I've never read to anybody else before, <clears throat> that will give you context as to what, what a lot of this is all about. But he decided he was going to sell it to the Vatican. And of course, when I first learned about this, I nearly lost my you-know-what. I'm mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? These are the last people that you want to give this to. Well, what we didn't know until years later is he pulled out <laughs> some of the best parts and disseminated them to his colleagues in the agencies, his brothers that he had um, completed missions on that literally were life and death. Some of the guys didn't make it. He trusted them and he gave them strict instructions that upon their deaths, that these items were to be bequeathed to Don Rue. So over the last, well, <laughs> five years, four of these guys have died, including Dan Spartan last year. And so we have a routine now. When he gets a letter, he gets a notification that there's a package being delivered. Don't open it, Don. Don't open it until I get out there. Guess what's going to happen when I go out there? He's got another box. And we're going to open that in the coming days. Now, this is, this is how it's been. This is how this stuff has come to us. And it was about two years ago that another box came or two and a half years ago. And in there was a letter from Bill Jackson that was written in 1994. Explaining to one of the colleagues, a guy named John Lennon, who lived, he worked for Scotland Yard and, and, and retired in the UK and London. And he died a couple of years ago. And in that letter, he says, I leave this stuff to my best friend, the only guy who took my archaeology research seriously for him to follow up on whatever might be left out there. So this is what we've inherited. Um, there have been other people who have tried to capitalize on this. One of those people is Zena Helper, and I know you know that name. The other one is the Oak Island Boys. Uh, they tried to get this stuff from Don, and Don said no. He said, I'm going to work with Scott. And um, so we're working together. Uh, four, four and a half years ago, I sat him down and I said, dude, you need to write a book. He said, I don't know how to write a book. I said, I'll help you. I wrote an outline for him and I said, just follow the outline. The book will write itself. And he did it. That book is amazing. It's not edited. It's kind of a, a challenging read um, from the organization standpoint. The stories are great. But now he and I are writing a book together right now based on four more packages that showed up since that book was written. So that's where we are now. So whenever you want me to read this passage, I'm going to read something to you that will put this whole thing into context. I've never read it. I've never shown it to anyone else. I've only had it for several months, but it'll it's amazing. Okay, and we'll do that after the break. Um, okay. and I, I want to circle back uh, because you mentioned that uh, Jackson wanted to sell the document back to the Vatican. 
And I say back to because the original purchase was in Italy. Yes. Right? Okay. Now, Not from the Vatican, though. It wasn't from the Vatican. No, no. It was from a prominent Italian family by the name of Benvenuto. Right. They, they were thinking of donating it to the Vatican. And Bill Jackson got to them before, <clears throat> before they could do that. And actually what he did was he didn't buy the document right away. He got a couple of pages that talked about the shipwreck. And mm -hmm. then he went up, they found the ship, and then he came back and he bought the rest of it. That's what happened. And uh, wouldn't it uh, have been a strange thing to have that go full circle, right? From Italy to the United States and then back to Italy uh, where it would have been disappeared. Well, you know, here's the, here's the irony, and I'll, I'll, I'll end this, this segment with this. So one of the pages that Don was bequeathed from Bill came to him in late 2017, and it's this Theban page. Now, <clears throat> what you can't see is that at the very top is two Latin words. And these Latin words, turn out, are the cipher phrase that you need to decode the Theban. Without that, the document is worthless. So guess what they bought? A worthless document because they can't read it without the cipher phrase. I love this guy, Bill. I love him. <laughs> let's uh, let's take our break. It, this is one of uh, uh, the story itself. Um, when we go back to uh, its origins, we're talking about the Hudson River and some guys just hanging out doing their thing that has uh, turned into this journey with so many individuals. You get brought in. It's a document chase. It's a treasure hunt. It's caves. It's maps. It's it's ciphers. It's everything that you can imagine, and all of it seriously just rewrites history. And and I've said this to you before, Scott. It all started at the Hudson River, just just doing stuff, and then the next thing you know, you're sh you're you're shipwreck hunting. Right? I mean, I mean it's absolutely incredible it's it's such yeah, a great you can't make it up can you no you, you can't. can't let's take our break right here our guest tonight the one and only scott walter hey scott hold, hold your ring up hold your ring up let me see that ring scott told me mine's in the mail we'll be right back <laughs> okay are you worthy is the question <laughs> Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. <laughs> ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only, at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, the Desert Dwellers, Poran Ki, and many, many more on four separate stages. There's 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and a full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Faded Black. Just go to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. Templars and UFOs. And uh, let's, bring, uh, let's bring Scott back in here. And, and uh, oh, okay, Scott's already got... See, everybody saw... I, I just brought this up. Uh, an empty chair. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, it's no, it's really funny. It's just like that's what I'm dealing with. I went to get a drink. <laughs> we got one and, hour to go, right? Yeah. I, oh, no, Scott, we're going to go late tonight. You've got you, you got to go late tonight. Yeah, we're you're traveling in the morning. No, so no, no, I'm not. No, I have. Um, I oh, have pro- a. You know, I had shoulder surgery, so I'm going for my doctor's appointment at 11:30, so I can sleep in. I'll go all okay. night if you want, man. Yeah, let's go uh, three, four hours. Why not? Um, uh, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so um, uh, jumping uh, uh, back into this, Scott, uh, where ultimately uh, with the Cremona document and everything that you have acquired, uh, ultimately where is this is this going to lead? Do you see um academia or some some verification of the facts uh, uh coming out and saying okay this is this is something that we need to seriously consider and look into well the answer to that is yes eventually that will happen um and i'll be honest with you we're we're holding on to these documents um uh, pretty tightly right now uh because we're not ready to share them with people because um, one of the things that, that we have here now, let's just go forward to this last box that we got from Dan Spartan. One of the things that was in the box was something we call map eight. Now, as you, as you go back and you look at the materials that we got, um, early on, there were four maps that 
were part of this collection of material, not the originals. They were in photographs that Bill Jackson had taken and the negatives Don acquired and then had developed. And here were pictures of these of these maps that nobody knew anything about before. One of those maps has been used on the Oak Island show for about eight years. That's what we call the Nova Scotia map. That's map number one. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we call it why it's number one is because that was the first trip that was taken in 1178. There are seven uh, or six other maps, a total of seven that we now have. Some of those maps have come over the last few years. But map eight, map eight is the holy grail of all treasure maps. It contains 13 parts. The parts are islands, land masses, where treasure was buried by the Knights Templar over here, including the Oak Island treasure. Um, In any case, this particular map was a compilation. I said this in the very beginning. Uh, In 1858, uh, um, a cartographer was tasked with assembling all this material and making map eight. <clears throat> and that map is sitting right over there. I can't really show it to you. Um, but what I would like to do is there are some things that are on the back of this map. It was originally on animal skin. <clears throat> Dan Spartan had it. Dan Spartan was Bill's boss and Don's boss. And they were all very close friends. <clears throat> I never met Dan Spartan, but um, I have corresponded with him. The correspondence has pretty much all been one way, him sending letters to me and me verbally transmitting information to Don, and then it goes through what they call the network to get to Dan Spartan, who doesn't live in this country anymore. Anyway, in one of those letters, he threatened my life. (laughs) He did it in a very clever way. I actually took it as a compliment. And basically what he was saying is, don't you screw with my friend like um, another person did um, who uh, was a female that Don was working with uh, several years ago. He really threatened my life in a very clever way. And someday, Jim, I'll share that letter with you. But anyway, I took it as a compliment and subsequent letters. He told me how much he appreciated how hard I was working with Don and taking care of his good friend. I love Don and I'm going to look out for him and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I want to do as much of this stuff with Don uh, as we can while he's still able. He's 79 years old, but he's doing pretty good. But I, what I would, what I would like to do, Jim, is there is a long narrative on the back of map eight that was written by the guy who made the map and did all this work the guy that wrote all of this um, and, you know, he didn't do anything with the original letters, but he compiled a lot of information and then he wrote this narrative. And I I would like to read part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I I, want to hear it. Okay. So it's written in French. Um, He uses Roman numbers for dates. I'm not going to talk about any of that because there's specific information about the cart- cartographers, uh, the explorers that they traveled with, who were members of the Order of the Temple, um, you will know just about every one of the names. Um, and some of the names that show up on here, um, <laughs> um, well, one of the guys was, uh, I'll tell you one name that's interesting. He was a member of the Order of the Temple, and he was the navigator for Columbus. Uh, His name was, where the hell is it here? Giovanni, da-da-da. Pedro uh, Alonso Nino. The date on here is 1499, when he did his work on the Order of the Temple, and I I know exactly what he did. Anyway, um, only the, here's what he says. I'll read the parts that I can read. Okay. Remember, this is a cartographer. He says, here's the first line. I am the last of my name. Clephas Licinius sailed with blank. 
in 1408, <clears throat> excuse me, 1158. And again with the Poor Knights of Christ in 1174 and 1180. Cliphas Lucilius. I, I can't read that stuff. <clears throat> I am making a compilation of their works along with that of Pedro Nino Alonso, dated 1499, the maps of so-and-so, and the map of so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and my own. Only three of our lineage have been creators of maps. We are known by our seals. And then there's some really important stuff here that I can't talk about that talks about a treasure that is not gold and silver. Um, may true believers recover them against Rome and other idolaters, 1722. An attempt was made to recover them in 1643, but failed. Many of our bloodlines are concealed under the names of others, pseudonyms, for being a cartographer and an interpreter of maps is a heavy burden, often a curse. Think about this. You are a map maker for the Knights Templar Order that has hidden treasures all over the North Atlantic, right? Do you think there's some people that like to sit you down and have a chat with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're the keeper of the secrets. You got it. So they obviously, these are not his real name. Um, sought out by the rich and those greedy for base profits. What will be the value if you gain the world but lose your soul? The truth will set us free. For wherever there is a treasure, there is also your heart. Hmm. How many? Okay, so there's 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 eight maps, and you said on map number eight there were how many locations? Thirteen. Thirteen, and uh, is one of those locations uh, the cave that uh, Jackson discovered? No. In the Catskills. No. Right. Okay. So uh, these are thirteen. This is after that. This is after I, that. But my point is uh, that these are 13 undiscovered locations. Well, in one of the letters that Bill Jackson wrote, which I think I have right, right here somewhere, he talks about, he talked about the, um, <laughs> hang on, I got it here. No, oh, that's there. But he talks about that there may be some of the treasures left. We actually went looking for one of the treasures a couple of years ago, and we found, oh, here we go. It's at the bottom, of course. This is October 12, 1994, Bill Jackson. This letter, the world is not seen. Dear Brother Leonard, I'm just going to read this part. Don Rue is the only person who took my research seriously and has helped me with it over the years. So I include this portion to him, but wish to do so after I have departed this earth. Since he is the youngest of the Spartan personnel, I think he will survive long enough for the current political situation in America to have passed on, leaving what I hope will be a more open government with less red tape. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this was written in 1994, and when Don read this for the first time, and it's recorded, I recorded it, Don just sat back and laughed and said, ah, well, Bill would be disappointed. <laughs> now, um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, oh, uh, okay, uh, I've got two two things I've got to get out of my brain. Go ahead. First is... Uh, not to disclose specifically where, but you did go on an expedition out west. Um, and and is that, uh, uh, okay. Well, see now you just answer my question. This is a different What's, thing. It, it, it's not connected. Uh, that other location out west. Yep, I know what you're talking about. Right, I haven't right. told you about this yet. Right. Okay. Okay. So now uh, back to um, the series of Cremona documents leading up to 1850. Okay, with the cartographer and the and the yeah, yep, the whole thing I just read. Yep. 
How many of the documents in your possession are originals? Well, original is kind of a misleading question. How many of them go back to the oldest document that we have is uh, mid 18th century. In other words, 17 something. Um, the, the bulk of the documents have been recopied right. and probably copies of copies. And most of the material we had was copied in 1858. We have that original material, but we know it came from much older material. You so, me? Yes. And so I'm asking because when you when you hold up a, a, a document in, in its plastic protective cover and it appears brown, right. that's an original document from yep. the 1850s. 17. Yes. 17. Yeah, 17. Yeah. yeah. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the Cremona document itself, the one that was purchased in the 70s, is that's a copy as well. Yes. That Correct. was now what we also learned from this latest box is that in the um early eight around 1825, there were two more copies made, and they went to Masonic lodges at different parts of the world. Now, what we would like to do is before we go out and do any of this stuff, we want to um, get funding and we want to do it on, um, on a series, um, on Netflix on, you know, somebody wants, is going to want to pick up this story because I can guarantee you, we are going to find, um, a few things, <clears throat> including, I would say a 90% chance that we will be able to find that ship that Don found because they didn't recover the whole ship. There's going to be a ballast pile down there. And, um, finding a 12th century Templar ship, I think would be pretty freaking cool. Don't you? Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's going to change things. That's a, that's a true game changer. Uh, the, the original urn, I just want to get to specific. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Where is that today? Well, Bill Jackson, <clears throat> um, reburied it in a different spot and he did not tell us where he put her. Uh, that's what that's what there are. There are a number of unanswered questions that only Bill can answer. Um, there are some documents that we have photographs of that we do not have the actual originals. Um, I will tell you that some of the things that are in these materials. Now, imagine, Jim, the Cremona document was copied in 1858 by Clyphus. And it was handwritten. I know his handwriting like the back of my hand. If you showed me a piece of paper and he wrote it, I would know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the narrative is in there. The maps are drawn into the book, except map eight. Map eight is three feet by two feet. It's huge. And there are letters that are stuffed into it. There are other parts of historical documents that are stuffed in there. Now, if people are listening right now, And Jim, if you have your phone, I want you to Google this. The Book of the Wars of the Lord. Just Google. The Book? I have a thing called a computer. I don't use my phone. The Book book of the the Wars of the Lord. And And uh, it's right here. Yeah. Okay. And what does it say? It says it's one of several non canonical. Uh, how, how do you say it? Non canonical, 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 canonical books referenced in the Bible, which have now been completely lost. It mentioned it's mentioned in Numbers twenty one fourteen fifteen, which reads. From there are a set out and camped on the other side of Ammon which is in the desert and bounding the Amorite territory. For Ammon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Uh, That is why the book of the wars of the Lord says, that is why the book of the Lord says, Wahab in Supa and the ravines of Ammon, and at the stream of the ravines that lead to the dwelling of Ar, which lies along the border of Moab. 
David Rosenberg suggests the book of David, uh, in the book of David, it, it was written in 1100 B.C., or thereabouts. Theologian Joseph Barber Lightfoot suggested that it was merely another title for the mysterious biblical book of Jasher. The so, book of the Wars of the Lord is cited in the medieval book of Jasher as being a collaborative record written by Moses, Joshua, and the children of Israel. Wow. Okay. Back in the very beginning, what you read was there is no extant copy known to exist, right? Right, right. Guess what? It's in the document. We have it. You have the Book of the Wars of the Lord. Yes. Wow. And uh, uh, now, you know, now, what? Just, now I, let, let, let me just let me wait, just wait. Uh, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Scott and I are going to butt heads, and, and, and <laughs> no, I'm, we're both so excited because this is cool shit. Uh, this is. Uh, I'm going to throw, uh, uh, I'm going to throw you under the bus just a little bit. Not Go much. Ahead. Go right just ahead. Your feet. Um, I've seen map eight and I know you don't want to reveal it on the show, but step back a few feet and just pull it out and show it. Just, just whip it out on, on the camera so everybody can understand. Just flash it. Just flash it. Yeah, there it is. There it, uh, 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 there's map eight right there. Yeah, you can't do I, I, I don't want anybody to do a screen grab, but there is yeah. map eight. And yeah. as we are referencing this during the show, now okay. everybody knows what we're talking about. Okay, now one more thing that you need to know is that we have an affidavit here that was written by Dan Spartan. Literally... Less than a month from when he died. This is uh, January. He signed it January 4th, 2021. He died February 22nd. Um, he signed it. His son signed it. His uh, wife signed it and their lawyer. And this is a detailed affidavit about the process of taking the rotting deer hide and copying it onto paper, which is what I just showed you. Because mm -hmm. I know everybody watching this is going, well, that's a piece of paper. What are you talking about? That's what we're talking about. It was on animal skin. Now, this is the neck map. This is the neck part of the animal that they cut off and copied on this piece of paper. <laughs> fruit, fruit, fruit. <laughs> yeah. I will just say this, and I am not kidding. If there are people watching right now that are fans of the Curse of Oak Island, the answer to that show is right here. <laughs> I am, and I'm dead serious. And, so, um, and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to reveal it. But what I will tell you is there, there was a treasure there. Now you said was. Well, there was a treasure put there. That was. So those guys are digging over there and there's nothing there. I can neither confirm nor deny. Right. Right. Look, at they watch and they pay close attention to everything I do. Oh, they're and, watching. You know, in, 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 in all seriousness, I have been invited on that show four times over the years. Um, uh <laughs> Kevin Burns called me twice personally. And if you know who Kevin Burns is, he passed away a little over a year ago. And he was a good dude. Ancient aliens. Um, spot, on, spot on dude. Yeah. No, and you, and you know what? He called me twice. And one time he said, Scott, we need you. And I said, I can't do it. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate I can't do it. And I, I won't go into why right now because it, it, it'll spoil it for some people. But uh, there's a reason why I said no. And believe me, I, I this ties directly into the work that I'm doing. Um, but, um, you know, the, the other part of this, though, is, and it wasn't Kevin's fault, but there's been some, you know, some shady stuff that's gone on. Um, and I will reveal this secret. Um, this person, Zena, who took one of the maps that we had, uh, they've been using for eight years, the Nova Scotia map. And then she also took another map that Don gave her. But what she didn't know <clears throat> was that it was a test to see what she would do. 
and it's this map right here. Yeah, this, I have that map. Yeah, yeah. This is the original. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Look at that paper. That's not old paper, is it? No. This is a map that was made by Bill Jackson as part of his novel. He incorporated the Oak Island story into his novel, which he never finished and it was never published. So Don gave this to Zena as a test and she took it to the Oak Island boys and they're still using this map on the show. And they know it's fake, but they still use it. So, uh, send all of your email to <laughs> scottwalter at gmail.com. <laughs> you know what? The truth hurts sometimes, pal, but you know what? Yeah, well, yeah, I talked to one of their I talked to one of their executives not too long ago, and they think our story's fake. And I said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute! <laughs> you're using one of our maps, one of Don's maps, and you're telling me that you think our story's fake? Really? It's hot really? in here, God! It's hot." <laughs> hey, listen, Jimmy, Jimmy, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, brother. I'm that, telling that, you, that's why we're bringing it. We're bringing it. That's why you're here. And, 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 and now, uh, back to, and we're going to continue this, uh, um, after the break. So I want the audience to understand that when we talk about the Cremona document, it is, uh, multifaceted. There yeah. is the original purchase that happened in Italy, 1971. And it that is a compilation and rewrites of the history going back to uh, through century. parts through parts the 12th century, which led to 10th century trips from Europe over here to what is now well, North America. We, no, we don't know if it was 10th century. It was sometime before that, maybe right. as late as that as the. The, uh, the 10th century. But what I will tell you is also in these documents is there is information that goes right to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. In fact, the key document that Ralph de Sudley wanted to recover and did recover was the marriage document of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And That's if right. you have read my book, Cryptic Code, you know that I um, have had some people contact me and share documents from the Vatican that basically state that they do have a copy of the marriage document, but the world is never going to see it. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. And okay, Scott, turn around. What is in the black frame? The oh. black frame. Oh. This one. What's in that black frame? I just want to see this really quick. The Man. crossed crook and the flail. Does that look familiar to you? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> our guest tonight, Scott <laughs> Walter. I want that in the bunker. Isn't that cool? That is too cool. It's called what? badass is what it's called. And so is Scott Walter. This is Finn <laughs> Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. More with Scott after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB. VX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Life Change Tea has a great offer for you right now. The three-pack special. Save $15 on their popular flavor pack of Super Tea. Get all three flavors, original, peppermint, and pomegranate. Life Change Tea tastes great. It's an all-natural gentle cleanse with a unique blend of 12 herbs that helps keep your digestive tract clean, clear, 
and healthy. And it's so easy to make. Just brew, steep, refrigerate, and drink. Serve hot or cold. And one to two servings a day is all you need. You take care of the outside. Do the same for your inside. Life Change Tea is made right here in the United States and helps thousands feel their best. It's an important part of any daily routine. So go to getthetea.com forward slash F2B. That's getthetea.com forward slash F2B. That's getthetea.com forward slash F2B. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of Forbidden Knowledge, and we're heading to Egypt this October. Come join Jimmy Church, myself, and the Forbidden Knowledge team as we spend a week exploring Giza, the Great Sphinx, the Great Pyramid, Saqqara, Dushur, Aswan, Edfu, Dindara, Karnak, and we'll celebrate Jimmy's birthday in Luxor. The Forbidden Tour of Egypt is this October 5th through the 12th and includes a four-day Nile cruise, expert Egyptologists, and a chance to explore Egypt with Jimmy and I as your host through your journey of a lifetime. Space is limited, so make your reservations now. Please visit ForbiddenKnowledge.com for information and complete itinerary. That's ForbiddenKnowledge.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, the Desert Dwellers, Oran Key, and many, many more on four separate stages. There are 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and a full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. Scott Walter. And finally, Scott and I are live together at the same time. And I, I, I totally dig this, Scott. And uh, let's let's talk about something very important. If, if somebody was here before Columbus and potentially discovered things and did a land grab and marked and left things, is this something that could change? I mean, could we be in the United States of the United Kingdom or the United States of, of Scandinavia or the United States of, uh, of, of Norway? And this would be a reason to suppress all of this because potentially somebody else has a claim to this country. That is an excellent question. In fact, I have been contacted over the course of the last four years by two different attorneys that were asking me specifically about the rune stone um, for that very reason. Um, 
that said, <clears throat> um, who would it be? I mean, stop and think about it for a second. You know, I, I say it was the Templars. I know it was the Templars. Who are the Templars? <clears throat> what nationality? What country? What group? Um, who do they represent? Um, now, it could potentially be uh, you have Scotland, you have the United Kingdom, you have Portugal, you have Spain, <laughs> friggin' Malta. Well, could... you, you got Norway. I mean, Norway. Yeah, you got Scandinavian countries. Um, <clears throat> but the but the truth of the matter is, um, the Templars were not. They didn't identify with any particular nation. They didn't identify. I mean, people identified them with the Roman Catholic Church, but part of the reason they were burned is because the church finally figured out that they weren't they weren't the Catholics that they thought they were. They were monotheists. They 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 embraced an ideology that goes back to Egypt and beyond. They venerated the sacred feminine. This is something that the church was not going to tolerate at all. So the point is, is that there is no country that can make a claim because the Templars were multi country. I mean, they were, they had, they had commanders in many countries. So, but, but really what, what, it, what this boils down to is that the ideology, the, the ideological descendants of the Templars are the modern day Freemasons, right? They were practicing Freemasonry. Our founding fathers inherited <clears throat> their work. They knew all about the runestone. They knew about the Newport tower. They knew about a lot of these artifacts that were left here but they just didn't tell anyone. In fact, these guys were also Knights Templar, our founding fathers, and they were all Freemasons. So 53 of the 56 signers were, were master Masons. So make no mistake that this country was founded upon the principles of Freemasonry that are an outgrowth of what happened to the Templars back in the 14th century. That's why we have freedom of religion in this country, right? Because they know what happens when one religion gets too powerful and starts to intermingle with the monarchies of Europe. Um, that's one legitimizing the other and putting, you know, the state above the people. So they wanted to create a nation that we now call the United States, where the people are supposed to be above the government. Now, over the course of the last several years, and we don't have to get into the details, we have clearly forgotten where we came from, right? People forget that we fought a revolution against what? A monarchy, for God's sake, right? So, you know, if you stop and think about it, um, it's obvious that the Templars evolved into modern Freemasonry. They are the ones that founded this country. They left these artifacts. The runestone's a land claim. And it doesn't make a claim for any nation. In fact, it's got 22 heck, uh, hooked X's on it. This symbol represents the essence of their ideology. Right. And so that ideology was one God that had dualistic aspects that keep things in balance. Male, female, heaven and earth, good, bad, light, dark. That's what this nation was supposed to emulate. And we have lost that. So part of what I want to do with this story, Jim, is to reveal this history in a fun and exciting way, but also to remind people where we came from, what these lessons were that we have forgotten about. And for some reason, people are scared, pardon my French, shitless of the Templars. Well, tough hop. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. And they weren't the good Catholics that, that they, you know, everybody thought they were. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And what they were is they embraced people from all nations, all colors, all creeds, and they venerated the feminine because women are the life givers. And this is something that we we need to remember, especially in this day and age. In our country, for God's sakes, when I go overseas, I have to apologize for my countrymen who treat people of color like shit, people that are gay or trans or whatever. You know what? I don't care what you are. Cut your arm. What color is your blood, Jimmy? What That's color right. is everybody's blood? We're all earthlings. Well, hey, not all of us. <laughs> is that the segue? 
Yeah, it, it, that was, uh, you know what? Like my phone call with you uh, two years ago, never ignore a synchronicity when it hits you in the face. Yeah. Right? Yep. It, it just, you just don't do it. Um, when uh, Let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, aliens. And just like anything that you do when it deals with rocks and artifacts, uh, you're looking at things under an electron microscope. You've got a laboratory. You are able to analyze things. Uh, you have dirt, debris, you have natural stuff, you have gums, you have glues, you have things that are that are part of it. You have tool marks. Um, uh, it, it, tools were used, whether it's 2,000 years old or, or 10 years old. You, you tool and carve these things uh, with something. And so you are able to look at uh, all of this and start to deduce things and, and come to some conclusions. So when, just like the Kensington Rune Stone, uh, that you have to look at very, very closely, and the Back Creek Stone and, and everything else, right? We could go down a long list of stuff. Um, when you look at these um, artifacts uh, from uh, Central and some South America uh, that clearly represent uh, what we now know today as um, alien or ET, um, uh, star systems, uh, star maps, solar systems, planets, asteroids, what looks like craft, uh, exactly. Um, what 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 kind of dating are are you looking at, and have you had red flags? Uh, what type of dating are we looking at? Well, there's two different ways that we have been able to date these so-called alien artifacts. Well, hold and, up this uh, artifact that you just, you don't have to use the light, but hold this up. Okay. And yeah, there's I a need reason. The light. Okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. You can hold it close to the camera just for a second. Yeah. And, oh, that's perfect. That one is uh, a little bit uh, different. Do you see the all-seeing eye? Yeah, of course. Of course. It's very clear. Yeah. Okay. So what? Uh, when you have an object like this, an artifact like this, um, uh, you are in possession of it. You didn't ignore this. Why is this in your possession? This one? Yes. Well, this particular one is because of that all-seeing eye I find to be very interesting and actually is sort of a dovetailing of the Templar story and the alien story. Um, one of the things that I was told by my contact is that Freemasonry is directly connected to the alien phenomena in ways that I am still trying to figure out. Um, this artifact with the all-seeing eye in, inside of an equilateral triangle, the delta, if you will, um, is a very important Masonic symbol. And um, it's, it's on our dollar bill, right? Um, it was designed by... Um, it was designed by Freemasons and initiated people. And the all-seeing eye goes back to the eye of Ra and the Egyptians and, and beyond. It's a symbol of deity. Um, a lot of people would use the term God, but I think deity is really a better term. But in any case, um, this particular one has, you saw the alien on the other side. What I haven't shown you is all around the edge of this thing are these symbols that we talked about mm -hmm. all the way around. And these, some of these are fairly complex. I know it's hard to see them, but I think you can see that uh, there's some pretty yeah, you can see, you can clearly uh, okay. see what's going on there. Right. So, you know, I, for me, it's, it's the symbols we are, are my number one thing, but here's what I'll tell you about the science that we've been able to do on these things. And some of the, the observations that we've made, this one here is one that I absolutely love. It looks like, um, you know, a big wad of grapes, but they're actually alien faces mm -hmm. and they're carved in three dimensions. And uh, on the back, we've got some dude in a spacecraft, um, you know, and, and then a spaceship down below. And um, now what do you see? What do you see with uh, with the grooves under an yeah. electron microscope? Okay. okay, that's a great question. Now, on some of these, and, you know, what I'm looking at here is to try to 
first and foremost, see if we can see anything that equates to weathering. And the answer to that question is we really don't see a lot of weathering in these artifacts. And the main reason for that is because they're found buried in the ground. So they're probably not going to experience much, if any, weathering. One of the other things that I've looked at or looked for, but I haven't been able to find yet, is evidence of secondary deposits. Well, I guess I have seen some iron oxide staining because when water percolates through the ground, it picks up minerals and it will deposit them on the rocks down below, right? We don't see a lot of that, but we do see some. So uh, that's really not an area where I can contribute too much. But when I do look at the grooves in some of these artifacts, and I don't know how the hell they did this, but imagine a groove that's cut like this that has a rounded bottom, right? I've actually seen where it looks like along that bottom of the groove that it was like, spray painted in and it's <laughs> you know a millimeter wide less than that um how the hell did that happen i mean that is a very curious thing that i i i don't even know what to tell you um but we have been able to date a number of the artifacts two different ways one was a pipe i told you about i know i've told you about this in the past a mm -hmm. small pipe. It was only about this big. It was really cool because it had an alien face on the front of the bowl. The eyes were carved out so air could go directly into the bowl and he had to cover his eyes to get the draw, to get the smoke, to, to inhale it. Um, there's all kinds of interesting symbolism there. But um, there was resin that was built up in the bowl and there was sediment on top of the resin, right? So that was interesting to me. And I thought, well, maybe we can date this resin. And so I ended up sending it to the lab. Well, I called him first and I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, hey, Scott, just send me the pipe. I'll collect the sample for you and we'll test it. Now, that was great because that eliminated one point of the chain of custody of that material. I sent the whole pipe to him. I didn't collect it myself. Have somebody questioned the way I did it. The lab did it. Okay. About three weeks later, I get a call from him and he said, Scott, he said, can you pay me for this right now? I said, sure. I paid him with a credit card. He sent me the email. Oh, before he hung up, he said, by the way, he said, don't ever send me another one of these things again. I said, why not? He said, just don't do it. And when I got the test results back, I nearly wet myself. Do you remember what that number was? I, I, uh, it was 15,000 years. Not that what? one. This, okay. this one was 5,400 BP. That's right. Before That's right. present. That's right. the youngest date that we have gotten, by the way. And so I think the, resin, the resin in the pipe was 3000 BC. 3,400 BC. Yeah, th well, okay, come on, yeah. Scott. Why do you bust yeah. my chops all the time? What's 400 you years amongst friends, right? <laughs> but but 5,000-year-old resin, is that, uh, okay, there's going to be people out there who say, you could fake that. Uh, how would you How would you do that? You tell me how you could do it. I don't know. I don't know. I, I okay. mean, I, now, I don't know. Uh, Scott, you're a pothead. What kind of resin was it? What? <laughs> what kind of what kind of resin was it? Do you, do you know? Was it tobacco? Was it something um, else? I don't know. Maybe it was DMT. I mean, I I, yeah. I have no idea. I mean, but by the time we I got the pipe back, he had cleaned it out pretty good. So I, that doesn't mean that maybe you couldn't take a solution and put it in a slurry and and somehow do some geochemistry on it. That's really actually that's a good question. We've never done that. Maybe we could. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, thought of it. <laughs> well, uh, pot pot was uh, uh, growing all over North America. Uh, you know, that's do you think they look? They've been smoking pot since the beginning of time. That's right. And who that's knows right. what other hallucinogens and other medicinal plants they were using to medicate or take a trip? I mean, so what? Maybe they get to an alternate reality and they see the. Maybe that's how they communicated with the aliens. How do we know? Yeah, 5,400-year-old resin. Okay, so back on to these grooves, though. Okay. Um, uh, what is, is, is it possible? I've seen, I haven't seen thousands of these objects, but I've certainly seen hundreds 
of, of these objects uh, coming out of Mexico. I've held them in my hands. I've shared images with you in the past. Yep. And, and these crazy dates are thrown out there, you know, 15,000 years old. What is fascinating to me is the intricacy of the work. Now, uh, some if, if it's modern, then there is a factory in Mexico somewhere that is cranking these out. And I just think that somebody would have been caught that these grooves are, uh, uh, what's, what's the word? It, it, it would be a modern groove. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't look ancient, right? Well, so what are you seeing with these grooves? Are, is there anything that tells you that these are modern tool marks? Well, no. I mean, I, well, I mean, if somebody wanted to make that argument, I'd say, okay, prove it. I mean, you know, you can take a sharp stone tool, you can flake it. I mean, you've seen some of these points that have been flaked by the indigenous people, and they're incredible. I mean, the, the level of detail, you could use them to do surgery, right? So to be able to carve what we see here, could they have created a tool that would do that? No problem. 10,000 years ago, I have no doubt that they could. However, I will say that the quality of the workmanship on some of these artifacts is astounding. I'll show you another one right here that is really, really cool. Okay. Now, this one is carved in three dimensions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See that? It's a base relief carving is what it is. And you can see there's all kinds of symbols on the top there. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And then on the back, there's some really, you know, amazing stuff as well. Yep. And I I don't the quality of this work is so good. It just seems that it's and and with such consistency that I, I just don't see this being a primitive culture. I see this the the, the quality of this work is it's it's outstanding. And so who did it? When did they do it? Um, these things came out of the ground for, for all intents and purposes. I, 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 until, until somebody shows me that there's somebody fabricating these in, uh, you know, a warehouse somewhere uh, down in Mexico, I'm, I'm going to take them at face value. The other reason why I take them at face value is you see this amazing one right here. Now this is obviously three-dimensional. These are individual pieces that, that have been set in like a mosaic, right? Right. Now, this red area here you see between the pieces, that is a glue. It's it's whatever's holding these together. Now, now can't this, you carbon date that glue? This one right here. Do you see this real light area right here? Yes. I got it. Everything's backwards. Sorry. That's where I scratched out a sample was along this little piece right here. Right. And I had that carbon dated. This we probably did this about three years ago. 14,000 BP. 14,000 BP. What the actual. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, that's the date. Okay. So now, so what does that mean? Well, it means either a, <laughs> this is a really old artifact that was made almost 15,000 years ago by a high culture that used some type of crazy glue that's holding this together. And it's incredible. Or the other possibility, and frankly, we have not tried to, uh, to vet this yet, is this could be a material called copal. Copal is an ancient tree sap that archaeologists are aware of that is, can be tens of thousands of years old that can be reactivated when it's found in the field. You heat it up, it will it will go back to a gelatinous form and you can use it as a glue and it'll set up and get hard. Now, could that be what this is? I can't say the answer is no, because I haven't tested it yet. I don't think it is uh, based on what I have seen. But the other thing is uh, that I've considered is, imagine this, Jim, have you ever been to, um, the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. I, I uh, the short answer is no. Have I had invitations uh, every year? Yes. Do I have friends that uh, go to that show and sell at that show? 
Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, so it's not so it's not going to be um it's not foreign to you that there is a show called the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show and I have many friends that deal there. I used to go there every year when I was in the fossil business. But my friends in the fossil business are collecting fossils that are tens and hundreds of millions of years old and then they collect Pleistocene material that can be 10, 15, 20, maybe up to 30,000 years old. Now what if somebody took a modern adhesive and ground up a bunch of Pleistocene bone, mixed it with the glue, and and you know put the adornments and or the mosaic on this artifact and and so on. What would the dating give you in that case? Probably give you an old date. Now, would it look like this glue we see on this piece here? I don't know. I haven't tested that yet either. But these are two of the other possibilities that we could be talking about. I have not done that work yet. Maybe somebody else is looking at it, but that's the way I would attack something like this to try to see if you can falsify it. Um, but so far, nobody's been able to prove that. I um, it, it seems that it seems that if all of this stuff is being hoaxed, that somebody's cover would have been blown by now. I would there, agree. I would agree. There's too many artisans, and some of these artists are really, really good. Yes. Whether it's 10,000 years old or it's modern, these artists are really, really good. But nobody's been busted yet. You well, would have thought that, you know. It, it, you, it, you, would, you would think so. But, Jim, did you see the episode we did in season four where I went with these guys, these four guys that brought these artifacts to me that they said they came out of a cave? This was over on the uh, – Eastern coast of the Gulf. Where the hell were it? Veracruz? Yeah, Veracruz. I remember that, and, right. and we shared those videos of the of, of the caves. Yeah, um, and I remember, think the, remember the artifacts and how bad they were. And yeah. the one had you know the cleverly disguised UFO. And oh I'll, I'll, God, I'll never forget that. I'm looking at this artifact, and we're shooting, and I'm like thinking to myself, "Really, dudes." And so I went over to the field producer and I said, Josh, I said, do you see this? And he goes, oh, shit. And, and then we called back to um, the network and, and said, what do you guys want to do? You know, I'm like, do you want me to bust them? And they said, yeah, go for it. And I was a little bit nervous about it. But you know what? The guys handled it in stride. They saw it. They went, oh, you know, you're right. And and they actually thanked me. Right. But. So, so my point is, is that there is some crap out there, right? I've that, seen the crap. I've seen that the stuff crap. Is crap. Yeah, there's and a you've big seen crap. difference. Yeah, there's a big difference between that stuff and these these and other artifacts. Yeah, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Uh, let's take our break right here, Scott. I got to get this in. We'll come back to overtime, and we're going to stay right here. I, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of of what is going on right now in ufology which is these artifacts coming out of Central America. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Scott Walter. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community, and with my personal invitation, you can, right now, get your free 30-day membership at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. 
Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right, one year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. We're going into overtime uh, tonight, and Scott has been showing us uh, some different uh, artifacts of the alien kind that um, have been uh, surfacing in, in Mexico. And, and I've been checking this out for a number of years, and I'm fascinated with it. And, Scott, um, a couple of years ago, I, had, uh, I was sent a video um, of uh, an excavation in a cave. And this is, this is what the video showed. Um, it was a, a first off, it was the expedition to the cave, right? That took a couple of days, uh, deep in the jungle. They get yep. there and, uh, they, uh, there's a series of ropes going down deep into this cave. The, they, they go back and they have dug out <clears throat> this artifact and it was big. It was like the size of a washing machine, Right. And and they pull this thing out, and as it comes out, and the it's, it's covered in dirt and mud, and they're wiping it down, and it's uh, a person sitting in a throne, 
Okay, so and it's square. It's it's massive. And they pull it out. They they get this thing. It, it's huge. It's massive. It's gigantic. Yep. Get in the back of a pickup truck, and uh, they take it back uh, into town, and they take it off of the truck, and they're starting to clean it off. And the high res camera shots that are going over this seated figure, um, you can see the cracks. In, in the marble or wh- whatever stone it is. Um, it, it's obviously very old and it's big. This isn't one of the tiny little things that, you know, right. knives or the pipes or these things, you know, uh, the, this is the size of a, a, it's probably bigger than, than a, a dryer or a washing machine, but <clears> it's a <throat> shape. Anyway, down one of the, uh, the arms of the chair, right down the front and the camera's going down. There it is. There's an alien face, right? It's it's right there. It's, it's clear as day. And they're wiping it away. And uh, now, as I look at this, okay, it is what it is. But somebody going through that kind of effort to hoax a, a, a one ton piece of granite, whatever this is, and to carve it, to bury it intentionally in this cave and do this expedition. Uh, and these weren't, these weren't, uh, how do I say this? These didn't look like seasoned hoaxers with money. These looked like normal people people uh, covered in dirt right uh, in, in this expedition right there's nothing professional about this and uh but they pulled the object out and i looked at it and the only thing that i could think of is why why hoax this now i never heard anything else about this object i, I didn't see any other videos i haven't heard anything and i don't know where it is it's probably but, uh, in china and why do you say that? Because um, I have been contacted by many of these people that are finding the exact artifacts that you're talking about. I got a guy pulled up right here. He texted me again today, and um, he says that they're pulling out these giant plates. Let you describe. Um, he said there's one plate they pulled out that was eight feet long. It was like four feet tall. It was a landscape thing with all kinds of alien figures. This particular one had aliens um, having sex, um, and it was a base relief carving, kind of like the one I showed you before, but it mm-hmm. was in jade. And oh. actually, I have a piece that came from that site right here. And if you look at, I don't know if you can see that carving. Yeah. There's a guy sitting there. Yeah. Looks like he's in... Um, uh, it looks to me like a ritual, but if you look at the other side, can you see the alien? Yeah, I can. And that's Jade. Both ends are Jade. There's another alien there. I think that's a female. Yeah, she's got breasts. Right. And uh, the other side has another shaman, I think. Oh, it's got an alien. <laughs> no, it's got an alien head and an, and a spaceship. But yeah. what's interesting is that the middle of this thing is bone. See that? Yeah. And there's a person right there that I don't think is an alien, but I I can't tell. And then it has maize, maize, corn. See that? Yeah. Yeah. So I tried to date this thing. I actually drilled a hole into the bone right there. Right. And the bone, the collagen in the bone was gone. So I wasn't able to date this thing. But um, <laughs> it's old. Yeah, and this is- was found down, in, probably found in an area very similar to where you were. But, you know, Jim, you mentioned something about a throne. And this is one of these serendipitous moments that's happening right now. Because I picked up this artifact. I put it in my lap. And I was going to show it to you. And then you started, to, you still haven't seen it, have you? It's no. in my lap. I saw you sit down with it. Okay, yeah. so what is it? Okay, well, first off, okay, 
That's crazy, right? Yeah. Okay, now this can be dated. I have not dated this one yet, but you see those eyes? Right. And the mouth? Those are those are adornments. Those have been added. Those have been glued in there. So this can be tested. But what I wanted to point out is you talked about a guy sitting on a throne. Can you see this guy here? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at that. And there's people attending to him. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? Yes. Trying to yeah. get the light on it, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very similar to what uh, yes. Wow. See that? Yeah. <laughs> so now, how about how about that for serendipity? Yeah, yeah. Uh synchronicity. Uh, Scott, what are we really talking about here? Are we going into um are we into some crazy form of cognitive dissonance where um, are are we looking at obviously hoax stuff that is too good to be true, and that it's 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 not real. It's it's just some modern thing that is going on. Or is is, is are these are these real ancient artifacts? I mean, what I'm I am so perplexed with this, and I, I'm trying to stay objective, man. I'm trying to stay right. I hear in the you. Middle. I hear you. Jim, you, you ask a great question. And I got to tell you, remember, I told you when I went to the Paradigm Symposium 10 years ago um, and I met Mark Russell and I saw these artifacts for the first time, that one I just showed you was one that I picked up back then. And I remember I bought a bunch of them from Mark uh, to get the price down. And I thought to myself, well, th these can't be real. Robert Bouval was at that conference and I asked him about it and he said, oh, these are fake. Well, this is long before we did any of this testing. This is before the pipe, uh, any of this stuff. I was so fascinated with this damn, you know, this these symbols on here. And I'm still fascinated. And getting to your question, are we dealing with what I would consider to be a hoax that actually exceeds, you know, the mystery behind the Burroughs Cave artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that people are still claiming. Oh, the cave is out there. And I say, well, when you find it, you call me. And I will say this about Burroughs Cave, and I'm going to brag just a little bit. Um, I knew Russ very well. I bought a lot of artifacts from Russ. He came to our house and he's one of the biggest bullshitters I've ever met. And he's lying about a lot of the things that he said. And I proved it. Um, to the, to, to date, I'm the only person that I'm aware of that has definitively proven one way or the other, uh, a Burroughs cave artifact. And unfortunately I proved that it was modern and it was fake. Um, so much for the collection of Burroughs cave that I bought, right? I just pissed that money down my leg, but the data is the data. The results are the results, but this is something that's different. And right now, Jimmy, if if you ask me, okay, Scott, you got to decide, right? Yes or no. Um, on many of these artifacts, not all of them, the answer is yes. Um, I think that they're, they are genuinely old. Uh, some of them, not all of them. Uh, I have no explanation for the glues. Uh, frankly, between you and me, this uh, Copal explanation and the ground up fossil bone, although I think it, it it needs to be tested, we have to take that off the table. I really don't think that's what's going on here. So what the hell is? I don't know. And the other thing, there are thousands, tens of thousands of these artifacts. There um, are. There are. I, They're all over the place. Here, let me show you something crazy. OK, you ready for this? This guy down that I contacted, or he contacted me and is sending me all kinds of artifacts that, frankly, I think are incredible. Um, this one is pretty nuts. Look at that one. Yeah, see, now that's a, oh, come on, right? I, I, that, that That's an, oh, come on. I know, but what the hell, dude? Um, I, know, I know, I know. Okay. Uh, okay, right. but here's, that's not what I wanted to show you. Here's what I want to show you, okay? <laughs> Okay. Um, it's it's a little hot there. Do you see see what see what that yeah. is? 
It's okay. a skull. All right. That. What is that's an x ray of what? A, no. What is it's that? A, it's a skeleton. Hold on a sec. Let me get this oh, laid off. Okay. All right. Can you see? Okay. Much. Oh, wait. Here we go. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hold it up. Okay. It's a skeleton of what? Of a, uh, This guy says it's an alien. Uh, where's that from? Is that from Peru? Southern Mexico. That's from Southern Mexico. Yeah. This is from like, I think he said two and a half hours uh, south, southwest of uh, Mexico City. Look at that. Yeah. Where are the yeah. hands? Where are the feet? Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's anyway, pretty crazy. And he's got uh, a you know, I don't know what to think about this. He's invited me down, but I know that the cartel activity down there is really, um, really bad. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to be used as a, <laughs> as a ransom tool. And I'm really frustrated, Jimmy, because even where Mark lives, it's really dangerous. He's been robbed multiple times down there. And I just don't need that BS in my life as bad as I want to go down there. What I would really like to do is to go down there with a film crew and actually dig some of these things out of the ground. I, I'd like to confirm that it's undisturbed soil, uh, that there's no evidence of intrusion, that these things are in situ. And what I would love to do is hopefully find a horizon or, or some organic material at the level that we find these things and date that. You know, that would be another way that you could potentially date these things. I have talked to people that have been down there and dug these up, not just Mark, but other people who are a couple of people who were actual scientists. And they said they found them within three to four feet of the surface. Some were shallower. I saw their videos. I thought I found it very compelling. Now, could somebody have faked that? I suppose they could have. Um, well, I don't think so. Here's, here's, I don't think so. When I uh, I held a, uh, there was two, but specifically a ceremonial knife, and it was probably uh, uh, close to two feet long with these uh, glued in uh, serrated ceremonial like teeth. It was beautiful, right? Okay. And on the hilt, on the, on the end was this alien head. Now I'm looking at this, and and I was told at the time, uh, yeah, I saw that. Um, like this? Uh, no. Uh, okay, so the see the the serrated edge, right? The serrated here, the, the one that I had. Those were glued in. Those were squares all the way around. Oh, anyway. you mean they were in, they were uh, adornments yes. that were yes, fit in? Yes, 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 yes. But oh, that's, yeah, oh, these okay. are open. These are carved in. You can see right. there. But here's the deal. So I was told then, as I'm holding this, um, and I'm thinking I'm holding BS, right? I'm not. Right. I'm not all in at all. And that I was. I was then told that the glue for the teeth, uh, right on on the edge, uh, on top and bottom, was fifteen thousand years old, carbon dated. Now I'm looking at it. It looks brand new. Well, you can see the dirt. You know, I'm not saying that, but but it looks perfect. Now here's my criticism of this that whoever the artist is because what i'm holding is frigging beautiful i'm telling like you that. It is, beautiful it's a beautiful. work of art and yeah. the artist creating that if they are creating it to hoax it's a wasted life that artist is Bingo. amazing right that should be yeah. a world famous i mean the the, the i mean Right, there's more money to be made in just the actual yeah. art, yeah. yeah, instead of hoaxing this stuff, and that's where um, my objectivity like goes out the window. That this artist would be one of the most famous sculptors in the world, yeah. No, and, no, Jim, you, you make a good point, and and that's that is that is one of those what I call human condition things, um. You know, it goes back to like Olaf Oman. People would say, oh, well, the farmer was too busy trying to make a living for his family. You know, he could never have carved it. Well, from a personal human condition standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. But that's not evidence that proves that he didn't do it. Right. Right. And, right. and so it's kind of the same thing here. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but if you look closely at these carvings 
And then the detailed work to make, you know, these little serrations in here. Um, it's I mean, beautiful. this is, this is freaking amazing. And then look at the dude on top here, you know, yep. it's like, yep. 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 and yep. then this is a separate piece here too. And, you know, you can barely see, you know, the group, you know, the edges where the two rocks meet. I mean, the work is exquisite. And, you know, why would you be screwing around? Like oh. you said, you could make a living doing this, no problem. You could probably sell a knife like this for 10 grand, right? I, on eBay all day long. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so that, I, 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 I am so confused with this. And I know. Uh, like I said, is it cognitive dissonance where um, I'm going to have somebody like Michael Shermer go church? Come on, that's fake. It's hoaxed. Well, okay, then Jimmy, this. Jimmy, is here's what you do. Here's what you do. Okay, look, I deal with this 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 stuff all the time, and and from people that are really smart and people that I love. You know, I I have a very tight group of researchers. And a couple of them are are pretty skeptical, and one of them drives me crazy because everything is not what you know we say it is. Now, those are the kind of people that I want around me because I want them to think critically. Um, I like to think that I'm objective all the time, but I'm not. I mean, you know, I look, I'm all in on the rune stone, and and you're not going to change my mind. But here's the thing: if somebody's going to disagree with me, or somebody's going to disagree with you, and they're going to get on your show and say, "Oh, that's a bunch of BS." The mm -hmm. next question for you from your mouth should be, okay, really? I appreciate that. Tell me specifically why you think that, okay? If it's just because you believe it to not be true, or as many people who tell me, I believe in the rune stone, I say to people, look, it's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of evidence. And when I draw a conclusion, right, I have to come loaded with the evidence to support the conclusion that I've drawn. It's the same thing for people that say, oh, that's BS. Really? That's great. Tell me why you think it's BS. And I think sometimes, especially if it's somebody that you know, like you and I, I mean, if you got into my grill about something and, and I was, you know, on shaky ground, you're going to punch me out a little bit, but I'm not going to be offended. At the end of the day, we're still friends. Right. And that's the kind of relationship I think that's so valuable because- Sometimes people are afraid to speak up and say, oh, Christ, that's a bunch of bullshit. Tell me, but don't just tell me what you think. Tell me why you think it. That's right. Because maybe, maybe you might be right. There for this, this is just how my mind works, Scott. For these thousands of artifacts to be created, there is a factory somewhere full of people with <laughs> Dremels, right? With Dremels, night and day. 3D. Yes, yes. Whole, whole, I mean. But the, the, the stones have to be brought there. They have to be designed. They have to be created. Then they've got to be shipped somewhere and dug in, uh, uh, holes dug, caves found, Artifacts put in, dirt refilled. That it's it's like this logistical nightmare. Somehow this and thing, not get caught and, and not, not get caught. caught. And, and here's another thing, Jim. Every one of these freaking artifacts is different. It's not like they're pumping them out in China in some factory where they're making tens. I mean, every single one is unique. Now you see a lot of the same iconography. You see you know, sort of the same sort of layout sometimes, but it's always a little bit different. And I'll tell you what, who's coming up with these damn symbols, okay? Everyone is different. Who's doing that? I know. Like Bob and Jill and Tom in the factory. Oh, what did you make over there? I mean. Right. Not and, not repeat. and not repeat. And not repeat. So ask your friends, the ones that make these blanket statements. I wish Robert Bavall was here. I'd say, Robert, you know what? I respect the hell out of you and I value your opinion, but dude, you got to bring some support to your opinion. Otherwise it doesn't mean crap. Yep. It's yep. just, that's it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough, man. Yeah. It's tough. And I've, I've held so many of these in my hands and, and looked at it really closely and I can't figure it out. I, I, I can't. I One can't. more question. Well, I got a question for you, Jim. Okay. And be honest, okay? Because we're all listening. So 
you hold one of these artifacts, okay? And you and I have just now been scratching our brains, trying to think scientifically, trying to, uh, you know, to think about it from a human standpoint. You know, could these people have done this? Going out in the field, digging holes, doing the whole thing that you described. But be honest with me. When you hold these things in your hand, what does your gut tell you? What does your heart tell you? Do you feel something? When you hold these artifacts, when you see these artifacts, <clears throat> is there something else that is hard to put into words that's hard to quantify? Yeah. But yeah. is there something there? Yeah, Scott, they feel magical yeah. to me. Um, there is just something so esoteric to them. Uh, the real ones. Um, and where they're... There's a there's a smoothness to it that this tactile thing that you get yeah uh, that uh, and they're all heavy you know these aren't soapstone no right it's not sandstone and it's uh, and they're uh, they're exquisite you know they're 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 perfect they're magical and I that's that's what I get from it, it there's something very very mystical. I'm telling you, um, I, 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 I didn't think about the resin part, but I did hold uh, one of the pipes, right? A, yeah. a, a bigger pipe than yours. And I looked right at that thing was smoked in. I yeah. looked right at it, you know, and yeah. uh, it's, and I just, and this is. So let me ask you this. Did you ever take that pipe and have a puff yourself? No, nah, I don't puff puff anymore. Oh, I don't, okay. I just don't for, puff puff anymore. Just for fun? No, I don't. I don't. I <laughs> I haven't done it in a while. Hey, Scott, <laughs> thank you so much. Listen, uh, good luck on your trip. Okay. Uh, keep me updated on everything, and uh, we'll get you back on the show when you get back. Okay. And uh, you'll give us uh, the updates on everything. Thank I, you so much. I certainly much. will. Hey, Jimmy, thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. This is so much fun. And um, you know what? Um, I'm with you. I'm feeling it on these things, too, right now. And uh, there's more to come, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, till the next time. Scott Walter. Scott, you're the very best, my friend. Thank you so much. My best to Janet. Safe travels, and we'll see you when you get back. Scott Walter. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Tomorrow night, Dave Schrader is with us. And tomorrow night, we are going to be doing the Rise of the Gods and how Marvel has taken upon themselves to crank out movie after movie, focusing on a different culture's gods. It's very interesting, and that's what we are doing tomorrow night. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. All of Scott's uh, hooked acts, Scott Walter, all of that, uh, the links for everything are over at jimmychurchradio.com. I'm going to get out of here. I will see everybody tomorrow night because I've got Dave Schrader here. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Dave Schrader, I want you to be safe. It's time to fade to black.